Starship Enterprise. As Captain James T. Kirk on the TV series Star Trek, actor William Shatner traveled to galaxies where no man had gone before. Enterprise from Kirk. Bridge Zulu. You have an intruder aboard. Could be masquerading as Crimson Green. Commanding the USS Enterprise, Shatner found legions of fans and TV immortality. But along the way, he lost his own identity. There had been problems for him. People felt they were locked into those roles and they couldn't be changed. People would be driving by and they'd go, Yo, Captain Kirk! In the next hour, we'll explore the strange and twisted journey of William Shatner. We'll reveal how the role that catapulted the actor to stardom left him broke. I was an international television star and I had no money. We'll find out how William Shatner tried to hide from his fans. I had heard about these Star Trek conventions and these masses of milling people and it seemed to be so undignified. We'll examine the mutiny on board the USS Enterprise. He was genuinely bewildered and, and hurt when he found out how much resentment that had actually been brewing all those years. And finally, we'll discover how William Shatner escaped the shadow of Captain Kirk and made a new start only to face tragedy. Imagine grieving over the death of your wife, but some tabloids imply that you killed her. I went through something I could not have imagined, and that was this terrible grief. This is the story of a talented actor trapped by fame and his struggle to reclaim his life. This is the story of William Shatner, the E! True Hollywood Story. I'm not a Starfleet commander <laughs> or TJ Hooker. I don't live on Starship NCC 170. William Shatner was born on March 22, 1931. The Shatner family made their home in the middle-class neighborhood of Notre Dame de Grace in Montreal, Canada. Bill's father, Joseph, owned a clothing company. His mother, Anne, was a homemaker who took care of Bill and his two sisters, Farla and Joy. But Anne always dreamed of becoming a star. Bill's younger sister, Farla. Perhaps she really wanted to be an actress, didn't pursue it, and sort of saw it through my brother's eyes. I was entertaining, apparently, in the womb or something. Some people knock on the womb wall. I was probably dancing. Ta -ta -ta, I'm going to be birthed right now. Bill's sister, Joy. His first little acting was about five years old when my uh, late mom and myself, we were walking down St. Catherine Street, the main street, and we heard an organ grinder playing in the distance and uh, Bill suddenly disappeared. Sure enough, he was dancing in front of the organ grinder, had a whole audience in front of him. The next year at summer camp, the six-year-old showed his true talents. He played in a play called Winter Set, um, where he, I played along with him, and he moved the audience so much, and he had the whole audience crying. I believe it was an uh, anti-Nazi play. And I can still remember at the time, me standing on stage and watching the audience crying. I was just dumbfounded. I said, my God, he's a natural. I remember taking a bow and looking with amazement that I had done this. And then my father taking me around and getting all the, the kudos. Um, it must have had quite an impression. Every weekend for the next five years, Bill appeared on stage at the Montreal Children's Theater. When Shatner was 10, he started performing on Montreal's Radio Fairy Tale Theater. The young boy enjoyed playing heroes like Prince Charming. In 1945, Bill entered West Hills High School. Sports and acting came easy for the teenager, but making friends did not. The kids on the football team never understood the plays, and the people in the plays were wondering why I was playing football. So it was like being out of sync with everybody. Including his dad. Joseph Shatner wanted his son to go into the family business, but Bill wanted to act. In 1948, he graduated from high school. To appease his father, Bill majored in business at McGill University. I was taking business classes, but all my time was devoted to the theater, much to my father's. He was very disturbed about the fact that his son was now veering out of control, and instead of following his economics degree, 
But Bill didn't want to disappoint his father. The two men struck a compromise. He gave my father a break by going in the, into the clothing business and helping out in the shipping room. And I remember he would pack boxes and he would sweep the floor. And one day I came in there and I said, oh, they say he'll never last here. In 1951, 20-year-old Bill and his father had a showdown. Something made me say in about my third year of university to my father one night, I don't want to do what you have in mind. Wow. So that precipitated a feverish discussion that went on for some while, weeks. He just decided that he wanted to be an actor no matter what. And my father was really beside himself because the chances were very slim of making a success of it. In 1952, after graduating from McGill University with a business degree, Bill was offered a job as an assistant manager at the Mountain Playhouse in Montreal. He accepted the job, hoping he would get a chance to go on stage when he wasn't counting money. His plan worked. I was running between the, the stage and answering the phone and saying, yes, seats H, 2H and 3H are your... Well, I lost money and I lost tickets and I never... But I learned my lines and I was good on stage. So she fired me as an assistant manager and kept me on as an actor. By the end of the first summer, the producer was so impressed with Shatner's acting that he recommended Bill to the National Theater in Ottawa. They offered him $31 a week. Bill quickly learned what his father meant by the term starving actor. It was hard for him in Ottawa. I remember the hard days he had. He didn't have any money, didn't accept any money. I lived in a terrible one room thing with a rope mattress. I remember the rope mattress and lots of mice because I remember one day I came home to my apartment. You couldn't call it an apartment, but my room uh, earlier than I was, usually was and the mice were playing around. I thought, what am I? Is my father right? Is my father right? No, no. In 1953, the young actor got an offer from Canada's newly established Stratford Shakespeare Festival. The ensemble was under the guidance of Sir Tyrone Guthrie. Guthrie was a respected director, but still, Shatner had his doubts. It seemed to me that this theater on Shakespeare was going to fail. And here I had a good job in Ottawa, which was paying me at least $30 a week. It was very close to the bone, but I was, I was still, I had this thing of saving me from throwing myself prostrate at my father's feet and saying, you were right. So I turned it down. But Shatner was wrong about the theater. The Stratford Festival was a hit. The following year, Shatner was approached again. This time, he accepted. Guthrie immediately took Shatner under his wing. For me, it was a big deal. Here was the guy who had directed Laurence Olivier, and he knew all those legendary people that I had only read about. Over the next three years, Shatner appeared in nearly 60 plays. In 1955, the ambitious actor landed a part in the Broadway production of Tamburlaine. Shatner loved New York and wanted to stay, but the struggling actor needed cash. Shatner took his $500 savings and tried his luck in the stock market. He put every cent on uranium and lost it all. I was destitute. I had no more money. It was like being blown out. And I was 24, 25. I mean, I wanted to get going. And I couldn't. I'd lost every penny. Coming up, Kirk versus Spock. He either got awards, he was nominated for awards, and I wasn't. And I thought, God, I'm doing all the work here. And later... What's your problem? My wife's at the bottom of the pool. In 1953, William Shatner was making a name for himself in the theater, but the young actor wanted more. More fame, more money, and he wanted it all fast. I thought that I needed to spread my sense of self around a little further. In 1956, Shatner married actress Gloria Rand, the couple met while working on a Canadian television series. That same year, Bill and Gloria moved to New York City. The actor didn't have to wait long for a gig. 
I started working in live television all the time. I mean, here I was. I'd just come from a rat-infested room uh, a year before, and I'm living in Queens in another sort of dingy apartment with my new wife, and we we're both two young actors seeking our fortune in New York. Hollywood soon took notice of the bright young Canadian. As a result of my television work, people at MGM were casting a movie called The Brothers Karamazov. I saw the story goes, they'd seen me on television, and they saw the contour of the face, so they called me in. The 26-year-old signed a contract with the studio for $100,000. Shatner got great reviews, but the actor didn't stay in Hollywood long. I went to New York to be in a play that I had read. I thought it was a very good play. So I dropped everything, packed our car up again, my wife, drive to New York to be in the world of Susie Wong. Shatner was thrilled to be back in New York, but working with his co-star, France Nguyen, was a different story. By the time the play opened on October 14, 1958, the actors were at each other's throats. She was the sensation of Broadway at that time. She was Susie Wong, and she was asked to do the movie, and uh, Marlon Brando, and she made the news, and it was big-time stuff. But the last thing she felt responsible for was coming in to do the play. And I had to prepare lines for every one of her entrances in case she didn't make it. Shatner had an even bigger problem on stage. And all the years now that I'd been on, in the theater, I never saw anything like that. What are they, they're getting up, they're leaving. Good God, this is a terrible play. I better start talking quickly because, and then I began to will them to stay in the seats. I am not going to, and I and I started speaking faster and, and, and doing every dynamic I could think of to keep those people in the seats. In 1958, Bill and Gloria moved to Hastings on Hudson, a suburb north of New York City. That year, the couple's first child, Leslie, was born. Shatner's second daughter, Elizabeth, followed in 1962. Three years later, Melanie completed the family. When you have children, suddenly, wow, that's no longer, you can't sleep in a rope mattress anymore. I could never save any money. I, I never was able to save any money. I'd make some money and it would be gone. Where did it go? What do you mean we can't pay? gotta pay the bills that's why I was brought up in 1965 Shatner received a call that would do more for his career than simply pay the bills the phone rang uh, in New York and it was Gene Roddenberry saying we've made a pilot called Star Trek with Jeffrey Hunter but the network would like to try again and recast it would you like to come and see what we've done the idea of playing in this thing so I flew to LA and I looked at the pilot unusual circumstances where the actor is looking at a pilot to see if he wants to be in it uh, and uh, I saw a wonderful kind of magical play. Shatner loved the script and was cast as James T. Kirk, captain of the Starship Enterprise. The actor signed on for $5,000 per show. The new pilot was shot in eight days during the summer of 1965. When uh, Captain Kirk came about I just fell naturally into this heroic uh, thing of the Shakespeare hero, the Grecian hero, and this guy who was leading this group of people into the unknown. Dr. Coleman, accompany the patient to the sick bay. Mr. Spock, take the ship out of orbit. By the end of the first season, Star Trek was nominated for five Emmy Awards and received nearly 30,000 pieces of fan mail. Despite the accolades, the series didn't perform well in the ratings. Executives at NBC considered canceling the series. Star Trek was perceived as a middle-of-the-road, middle, popular, middling, good uh, series. What's the matter? Can't you sleep? Nope. Try taking one of those red pills you gave me last week. You'll sleep. The show's creator, Gene Roddenberry, came up with an ingenious scheme. They started a chain letter, in effect. Send this to ten of your friends. Don't cancel Star Trek. And it was enormously successful. The plan worked, and NBC renewed the series for a second season. Shatner was glad to return to the Starship Enterprise, but he had issues. Co-star Leonard Nimoy, who played Mr. Spock, rubbed Shatner the wrong way. He was doing so well, and the character he was playing was so kind of different that uh, he, he either got awards, he was nominated for awards, and I wasn't, and I thought, God, I'm doing all the work here, I've got all the lines to learn, 
and struggling every week with all this. He's getting all the approval. I was thinking about the buffalo, Mr. Spock. On set, the two actors clashed. The conflict became so unbearable that director Joe Pevney called it quits. At home, Shatner faced a different set of problems. If you're a lead in a series, you have no time for anything else. An actor who takes on a series is jeopardizing many relationships. Shatner's daughter, Elizabeth. I don't remember spending tons of free time. He didn't, he didn't have time to come to like parent-teacher conferences a lot. Despite the difficulties on the set, Star Trek was renewed for a third season. The show, however, received a new time slot, 10 p.m. on Friday nights. Roddenberry was unhappy with the switch and quit. The network brass hired a new producer, but the third season was the last. Star Trek wrapped on January 9, 1969. As an added insult, NBC execs decided to air the final episode on a Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. I remember being quite ill with the flu uh, when it was canceled. So whether it was the flu that made me feel badly or the cancellation, but I, I was pretty desolate. I guess the hard work, all the hours, and then the, the disappointment that this was our last show. Three months after Star Trek went off the air, Bill and Gloria ended their 13-year marriage. Gloria got custody of the couple's three daughters. To be separated from the family that I needed and my children whom I adored was very difficult. So I was right now back to where I had started in, uh, before Star Trek. William Shatner was separated from his family and nearly broke, but tougher times lay ahead. Coming up... I was an international television star, and I had no money. In January 1969, after three seasons, the television series Star Trek was canceled. 38-year-old William Shatner was out of a job, flat broke, and newly divorced. There was no money coming to any of us as a result of, of our being played day after day. By the spring of 1969, William Shatner wasn't having much luck finding work in Hollywood. I put together plays and toured in plays. Uh, in the summertime mostly, and looked for work in uh, New York or Los Angeles. Bill found ways to make ends meet. On the road, the actor lived in a camper shell on his pickup truck. When I'd get to the theater, I'd remove the shell, which stands on four legs, and drive the truck around for transportation. Then when the, when the week was over, I'd back up, slip the shell onto the bed of the pickup truck, and go to the next theater. Performing in summer stock productions didn't pay a lot. Also, Shatner wanted to spend more time with his children. The actor needed to find a project that made enough money to allow him to stay at home. Shatner decided to record an album called The Transformed Man. I did six, seven cuts of that kind, where I took literature with new music, and went into a song that was popular at that time, and tried to show the relationship between the two. And the song was either the same philosophy as the literature or it was contrapuntal and that's what I did now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height when I went along with the fun and it is fun it's kind of weird but it was a weird I the whole idea was weird it's cool unfortunately when the record was released listeners thought it was a joke the TV series Star Trek, however, was finding new life in syndication. The network was raking in the money, but that wasn't the case for the Star Trek cast members. I was an international television star, and I had no money. It isn't fair. No, it isn't. You punished and tortured me because of it. The actor's contract stipulated that he only received residuals for the first five repeats of an episode. Certainly by a year or so after it was off the air, on regular network television, we no longer received any money. But by now it started to get popular in, 
and syndication. Something else happened. Fans began to pack auditoriums across the country for Star Trek conventions. Cast members were offered a lot of money to appear, but Shatner wanted no part of it. I had heard about these Star Trek conventions and these masses of milling people, and it seemed to me so undignified, and that's not what actors do. Bill wanted to act. In the spring of 1970, he landed a role in a PBS Civil War drama entitled The Andersonville Trial. On the set, Shatner met 24-year-old production assistant Marcy Lafferty. One thing led to another. I'd been divorced, and we started going out. On October 20th, 1973, Bill and Marcy tied the knot. I'm programmed to be married and be a family man. I love being married. I love the family. I love the roots. I love going home at night. With Marcy by his side, Bill's personal life was back on track, and so was his career. Throughout the 1970s, the actor appeared in television movies like Kingdom of the Spiders, The Crash of Flight 401, and The Babysitter. But Shatner got some unexpected help from a film he didn't even appear in. In May of 1977, the blockbuster Star Wars was released. The movie's phenomenal success got executives over at Paramount thinking. William Shatner's manager, Larry Thompson. Jeffrey Katzenberg called me and uh, says, well, Larry, we're thinking about doing a Star Trek movie, but we're not sure it's a theatrical movie or if it's a television movie. So we want to make a deal with the cast members as if it's a television movie and keep the cost down on it. And I said, this is going to be a feature. Isn't it? <laughs> Thompson made sure his client was handsomely rewarded for returning to the helm of the Starship Enterprise. In the fall of 1979, shooting began for Star Trek, the motion picture. Bill's son-in-law, Gordon Walker. That was such an event. It wasn't just a movie. It was Star Trek, you know, crew coming together for uh, their first movie. And, uh, I mean, gosh, it was the cover of Time magazine that year. On December 6, 1979, the first Star Trek movie was beamed into theaters. The film became a huge hit earning $178 million. Executives at Paramount were thrilled. They immediately wanted to do another, and then they knew they had a franchise. Coming up, Captain Kirk faces his crew. Their complaints were, in many cases, designed to sell a book. It's idiotic. In 1979, 48-year-old William Shatner was finally making money as James T. Kirk. The first Star Trek movie was a major hit. Shatner loved the attention, but he wasn't looking to command the Enterprise forever. You do a job, and then the job is over, and you're, you're on to the next job, but the public has identified you as a certain thing, Captain Kirk. In 1982, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, was released. The sequel quickly outpaced the first Star Trek movie, grossing more than $80 million during the first few weeks. Paramount immediately laid the groundwork for a third film. William Shatner was becoming even more closely identified with his alter ego, James Kirk. Actor and friend, Patrick Stewart. There had been problems for him for a number of their cast that, that they, people felt they were locked into those roles and they couldn't be changed. Bill's daughter, Leslie. That was a problem for him. And I think he was frustrated initially. As an actor, William Shatner wanted to stretch and started looking for other acting gigs. I got a call one day from uh, Lena Goldberg, who had been in partnerships with uh, Aaron Spelling, Spelling Goldberg, and said that they had an idea for a show, uh, that it was a cop show, but they thought Bill Shatner would be right for it. The idea of working on something other than a science fiction show appealed to Shatner. In January 1982, the actor signed on to play the lead role in the police drama, T.J. Hooker. T.J. Hooker was a cop, a uh, conservative cop. And um, we, we kind of evolved this background story of T.J. Hooker resented all the rights that the perpetrators had and the victims didn't. And he was angry about it. The series debuted on March 13, 1982, on ABC. Audiences came to accept Shatner in a different role. Co-star, 
Adrian's Med. In the beginning year, when we were, you know, uh, doing uh, working on locations and stuff like that, people would be driving by and they they go, "Yo, Captain Kirk!" And in about the second year, beginning of the second year, you started to hear, "Hey, Hooker, TJ," and he was very happy to start to, to hear that kind of stuff. Even though Shatner wanted to distance himself from the role of Captain Kirk, he couldn't resist the money. For the next five years, Shatner juggled his TV show with filming Star Trek. In the process, Nimoy and Shatner patched up their differences. It's wild the way our lives have are star-crossed uh, with each other. It's a, it's a very similar pattern. Uh, so that was more the force than any petty thing that might have happened. But Bill Shatner's relationship with other cast members wasn't quite as friendly. Knowing my dad, he just he's very uh, directed and very businesslike. And just when something needs to be done, he wants to get it done, get in, do the job, leave. And I think that he probably came off as being not aware of other people. Their complaints were, in many cases, designed to sell a book. I uh, think one of them has said, well, he wasn't there when they wheeled out the Enterprise spaceship. Or he took a close-up away from me. Or I mean, it was it's idiotic. Shatner needed to resolve his problems with cast members quickly. In 1988, Shatner signed on to direct the film Star Trek V. As an, an actor who had a lot of opinions about how things should go, I think it was just sort of a natural extension of what he was doing. But the picture was the least popular to date, earning just $52 million at the box office, about half what Star Trek IV brought in. Over the years, Shatner had developed a love-hate relationship with his character, Captain Kirk. Still, the role provided him with the money and freedom to try other things, including writing. I put down T.J. Hooker in uh, science fiction, a cop in a science fiction uh, environment. And that was the one line idea. And then I started to expand it from there. And that became Tech War. It evolved from a book to a series, which he got to write and direct and executive produce. So I think that was a very much uh, his vision and focus and something that he enjoyed very much. But no matter how hard Shatner tried, the Renaissance man couldn't escape the shadow of Captain Kirk. Coming up, tragedy strikes. Imagine grieving over the death of your wife. The public not only being interested, but some tabloids implying that you killed her. By 1988, William Shatner was enjoying success as an actor, director, and writer. But Shatner still couldn't escape the role which catapulted him to stardom. The captain's days were numbered. We knew that this movie was going to deal with uh, Kirk's demise. And we were ready for that. By the early 90s, it was apparent that the Star Trek cast was aging. Paramount made the decision that Star Trek VI would be the last movie starring the original cast. To make matters worse, Bill and Marcy were growing apart. Shatner was known as a ladies' man, and Marcy was fed up. In 1994, the two ended their 20-year marriage. Before the ink was dry in the divorce papers, the actors started seeing model Noreen Kidd. That same year, Shatner was offered one last chance to play Captain Kirk in Star Trek Generations. The new movie featured the younger cast from the TV show Star Trek The Next Generation. In the film, Captain Kirk meets his death. I think everyone was very conscious of the fact that a, a little tiny bit of film history was being made. Despite his ambivalent relationship with Captain Kirk, it was very difficult for Shatner to give up the role forever. It felt a little strange to be a guest on my own show, so to speak. But the, the real experience of Captain Kirk uh, dying on film was the fact that I had to think of my own death. At some point, you recognize you're dying. That moment, that instant of recognition of, I'm stepping off the diving board into the pool. I don't know whether it has any water or not. I don't know where I'm going. What panic, what fright, what, what are your emotions? 
think about it is really a, upsetting. To publicize the movie, Shatner was asked to appear at Star Trek conventions around the globe. The actor was forced to face his fans. One day, boom, the light goes on. Who are these people out there? And I decided to find out and started to interview them. He would go to the Star Trek conventions dressed as a, as a monster, an alien, with um, a recorder and would interview fans about, you know, why they were fans, what they liked about Star Trek. Shatner's research culminated in a book entitled Get a Life. Captain Kirk may have been gone, but William Shatner still had a lot of living to do. On November 19, 1997, 66-year-old Shatner married 38-year-old Noreen Kidd in Pasadena, California. She became wife number three. In 1998, William Shatner took on a new role as spokesperson for the company Priceline.com. Uncanny. The deal made millions for Shatner and allowed him to kick back and enjoy life with Noreen. He was crazy about her. I mean, he used to say to me, isn't she great? And then we'd follow her and he'd say, isn't she wonderful? Look how great she is. He kept stressing that. And, uh, but then I realized as time went on that she had a major problem. The problem was alcoholism. He knew she was ill. But knowing him the way I do, he always thinks he can solve all the problems. And I believe that he married her. He loved her and he felt that he could really help her and change her. In the summer of 1999, Noreen checked herself into Friendly House, a rehab center in Los Angeles. Peggy Albright is the director. Noreen Shatner had a problem with alcohol. No, she was not a drug user. Alcohol was her drug of choice and it was her demon. She tried with every valiant, brave ounce of energy she had in her heart, and she had a, an amazing heart, and she had a, she's a brave person. And I don't think that we really understand everything about addiction. Noreen spent most of the summer at the rehab center. In late July, she was released. Noreen was gone a couple of weeks, and William Shatner had called again and asked if I would work with her, his wife. And of course, we will always work with a woman. We have a, a disease of relapse, and this does happen. Noreen was to come back into Friendly House on Tuesday. On Monday, August 9th, William Shatner planned to have dinner with his daughter, Leslie, in Orange County, California. We have a beach house that we go to, and uh, he came down to visit us that day. And I know she really wanted to come, but I also know that she had been doing a lot of drinking and he didn't want to bring her and have her around the kids. She was drinking despite the warnings of uh, everybody in her life who, was, who were very concerned about her and my dad thought it best to um, have her stay home. Coming up. My beautiful wife is dead. She meant everything to me. In 1997, 68-year-old William Shatner married his third wife, Noreen Kidd. But the couple's relationship was rocky from the start. Noreen was an alcoholic who desperately needed help. She was a very tortured, very troubled woman. At 9.30 p.m. on August 9, 1999, 68-year-old William Shatner returned to his Studio City home after having dinner with his daughter. The actor's wife, Noreen, was nowhere to be found. Shatner was worried and called Noreen's AA sponsor. She told Bill that Noreen wanted to go for a swim. Shatner immediately went to check out his pool. When Bill looked in, he was horrified. He quickly called 911. Oh my God! Hey, what's the problem? My boat wife's at the bottom of the pool! Okay, did you get her out of the pool yet, sir? No, not yet! Okay, I want you to take her out of the pool right now, sir. I'm gonna take her, she's at the very deep end! Okay. Grab something yes. and get her out of the pool. Yes, sir. Sir. Yes. We're on the way. Get your wife out Thank of the you. pool. But don't hang up the phone. Hello? I got a call about 11 o'clock at night from my sister telling me what happened. And, and I just remember, I just was so shell-shocked. And then 10 minutes later, I see it on the news. And 
It was just mind-boggling. Within minutes of the 911 call, the Los Angeles Fire Department arrived at the scene. At 11.26 p.m., Noreen was pronounced dead. It was tragic. And, uh, I mean, this is something that uh, most people in the world would never experience. But to come home and find your wife drowned in a swimming pool and dead, that's traumatic. My beautiful wife is dead. She meant everything to me. Two days later, on August 11th, the L.A. coroner's office announced its findings. Deputy Coroner Craig Harvey. There was uh, uh, some alcohol and prescription drug levels found in the blood, but the uh, cause of death was drowning associated with neck trauma. Uh, at autopsy, we found some fractures in the cervical vertebrae, and uh, those were a little bit puzzling at first. That's not a very common finding in a straight drowning. So those kinds of things are red flags. The Los Angeles Police Department and the coroner's office wasted no time launching an investigation. It's the responsibility of the coroner to rule out foul play, but further investigation, uh, we became satisfied with what the reported details were of the, uh, of the incident and went ahead and closed the case out as an accident. But closing the case didn't stop the rumors. Imagine grieving over the death of your wife, the public not only being interested, but some tabloids implying that you killed her. His devastation and his sorrow and his tears and his heaviness of heart, it was just a terrible time for him. I went through something I could not have imagined, and that was terrible grief. I've learned since then that grief is is, is, is very, you can account for the phases of grief. Different people do it in different ways. But you go into the denial and the anger and the resignation and the acceptance. So I was in shock and it took me about three or four months before I came, started to come out of the shock. In August 1999, Bill created the Noreen Shatner Foundation. After she had her accident. William Shatner called me and told me that he would like to pursue what Noreen wanted to do for Friendly House. William Shatner bought us this house. Coming up, Bill finds love again. I found myself starting to look forward to his phone calls and just, you know, enjoy talking to him. In August 1999, 68-year-old William Shatner lost his wife, Noreen, in a tragic drowning accident. After four months of mourning, Shatner received a letter that changed his life. I sent him a sympathy note, and um, a couple months later, he responded and got my telephone number and, and um, called me. William Shatner tried to keep busy after the death of his wife. The actor spent most of his time working with his horses. As a kid, I loved horses. I never could afford to even rent one, but I used to swap out stables to, to have a ride. Today, Shatner breeds and shows American saddlebreds. Ladies and gentlemen, please salute the amateur fine harness world champion tonight. Here's Revival and William Shatner for Bell Rev. I won the amateur harness, fine harness uh, class with him, a world champion and something we've been trying to do for years and finally accomplished it. So only the people in the know would know how much time and energy and money and attention and sweat and, and dreams were lavished on uh, this win uh, that I made. Bill's love of horses drew him to 42-year-old Elizabeth Martin. Elizabeth was a horse trainer whose husband died of cancer two years earlier. We're both in the saddlebred horse business where we were. Um, so I'd seen him uh, in classes and he'd seen my late husband and I working, but um, no more than congratulations and, you know, passing, working. That was the last 10 years. And 
How we really um, met was after the death of both of our spouses. I had um, heard, you know, heard on the news what happened and had mutual friends. So I sent him a sympathy note. This was a note from her saying, I know what you've gone through. There's anything I can do to uh, help you through this passage. And so I called and we began to talk on the phone. I found myself starting to look forward to his phone calls and just, you know, enjoy talking to him. So, um, you know, the friendship grew and went, to, went out riding with him a couple times. He came out riding with me and, and uh, our first, uh, the first thing I ever did with him is we went to New York. And then that's the trip I just really fell in love with him. She led me, helped me, assuaged me in many ways with my grief the grief that she had gone through two years prior and was still going through so one of our common bonds at that time was the mutuality of grief Shatner said I do for the fourth time Bill and Elizabeth Shatner were married in February 2001 they both are really happy and it's really nice to see my dad happy and healthy and functioning and um, just enjoying his life. Now in his 70s, William Shatner is still going strong. The actor appeared with Robert De Niro and Eddie Murphy in the comedy Showtime. That's Bill. The Bill in Showtime, that is Bill. That was him behind the cameras all the time. He says, no, 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 let, let, let me like grab onto the rung of the, of the helicopter and then let's like, you know, and then they take it up and then I'll take out my gun and say, bring it down. And then the technical advisor says to Bill, but Bill, cops don't really kind of do that. Just, Trust me, the audience will love it. He was right. For more than 50 years, William Shatner has been in the business of entertaining audiences, and he isn't done yet. I would describe him with all of the adjectives that you would use to describe a hero. And um, because he truly, he fits that description. His being so fully committed to the moment is something that you feel when you're in his presence and that's what's so energizing about spending time with him i'm not fulfilled in terms of anything because there's so much more to do there's so much more love to give and to take there's so much more work to perform there's so many more laughs and tears to evoke there's so much to be done that's why i have to go It was simply the most incredible, frightening, exhilarating experience I've ever had.